the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they were the uh, names the Babylonians gave them, but they, they uh, just, uh, the, the book of Daniel, uh, at least in the narrative part of it, is just an amazing, amazing book. Uh, let me just read to you from um, uh, chapter 1, and then I'm going to just read two verses, then give a little bit of historical background. It said, in the third year of the reign of Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Uh, these he carried off to, uh, to the temple of, of his God in Babylonia. And put, it, and put it in the treasure house of his God. Let me just give you a little bit of historical background. Um, because I love maps, and any reason to put up a map is, um, is, is, uh, is a, a, a good enough reason. But what had happened, of course, when uh, God brought the uh, children of Israel into, into the nation of um, Canaan, it was, uh, it was quite a few hundred years before they, they were actually uh, uh, really felt they were a single unit and that, um, that, that happened uh, uh, just before 1000 BC when they had their first king and of course their first king was Saul. Then uh, he was not the king after God's heart but the king after God's heart of course was David but David was too young at this stage to actually be the king. And, and so the nation endured, and uh, I should have put up my first map, goodness. So here was the, here was the nation of Canaan, or what, uh, what, what, what we know as the nation of, of Israel. So the uh, first king, Saul, was not a, not a godly king. He, uh, there are times that the Spirit of God would work with him, but within the man's heart, he did not have a heart for God. Then, of course, God raised up the man who had a heart after the very heart of God, who was King King David. And that was uh, approximately 1000 BC. Then, after David, David's son Solomon came to the throne. And Solomon wanted to uh, build the temple that, uh, that God had given the, the plans to David. But what Solomon, he, when he was trying to work out where to build it, he did not want to build it in the middle of any one particular area so that the nation would say, oh no, you're down there and, and, and that's where the capital is and we're up here. How many of you know that when they were going to build and work out where Canberra was going to be, do you know how they de determined where they would actually build the city of Canberra? They looked at Melbourne, they looked at Sydney, and they went halfway between. Because they were the big city. They did not want Sydney saying, well, you know, all of Australia was government from here. They didn't want Melbourne. I mean, especially they didn't want Melbourne. They didn't want Melbourne saying that. So they went halfway between. And in an area at that stage where virtually no one was, just farmland, and that's where, um, that's where Canberra came from. So what happened here was when Solomon looked for a, a, a place, he actually chose a place that would be um, sort of in between virtually the uh, area that Judah had and the area that Benjamin had. But whether this was great wisdom or not, he had those who worked on the temple were principally those from this, this northern area. So then after uh, Solomon's passing, uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam be, became king. But Rehoboam did not have the wisdom that his father had. And under Rehoboam's leadership, there was a civil war. And then Jerusalem, uh, sorry, then Israel divided into the uh, northern kingdom, which is in green up there, and into the southern kingdom, which is kind of an orangey brown color. The southern kingdom became known as Judah, though it actually comprised um, the, uh, the uh, tribes of Benjamin and Judah, and then the uh, northern section in green up on that map were the, were the, 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 the other ten tribes. So um, we are now following down, and then over the years, the northern part had, had let go of their um, hold on, on God, and so God let go of his hold on them. Then in, in 722, he caused the Syrians to come down and they overran the entire area and they deported those uh, into the area of Syria. Then God uh, raised up more and more prophets to uh, Judah, warning them that if they did not turn their hearts to God, that they would lose their land in the same way that the northern kingdom had. And they did not turn their hearts to God. And so God caused 
the uh, growing kingdom of uh, Babylon who had overcome the Assyrians just some, some years earlier to come on down and then to besiege Judah and to besiege Jerusalem. So we're coming right down to our, our, our time here now. And so without actually destroying the city initially, the king of that time, Jehoiakim, he in that sense, he surrendered the city to Babylon. He was taken, he was deported, but the city remained intact. But when this king was taken, quite a few of the leaders in the area of Jerusalem were, were taken into Babylon too. And they included Daniel. They included the three men that we now know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now these were people of a priestly background. Daniel, of course, his father was a priest of the tribe of Levi. And so these were men who had been brought up to, uh, to live by the standards that were the Jewish standards for the Levites, for the Levites. So we've uh, come down on the scripture I've just read. That's, uh, a year is now 606 BC. So the, uh, so the first group have actually gone into, into cap captivity. Oh, we've got this picture. Um, so just a put portrayal of the Babylonian army surrounding Jerusalem. And of course at this stage they did not destroy the city because the city was surrendered. What would um, happen is that the Babylonian regime would set up a puppet kingdom and then they um, set up one king, from, actually from the royal family, then a second king, but when, uh, when these kings did not do what Babylon wanted, wanted done, uh, the um, armies came back and then they besieged the city another time, they destroyed the city and they burnt the temple down. It was, it was com completely gutted. Alright, so, so back to our text. I'm reading from verse 3 of chapter 1 of Daniel. Said then the king ordered uh, Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. So this is the uh, the um, uh, Babylonian leaders, and they are they're asking for these Israelites, those that have been taken from Jerusalem. Then verse four says, young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude in every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand. And qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter into the king's service. Perhaps I'll, I'll read the next part. Among these were from Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave the new names to Daniel. He gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, the name Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to uh, Azariah or Azariah, Abednego. Alright, so, so our story will then pick up on these, on these four young men. They had shown enormous promise. Now they had been removed from the world they knew, brought into a world that spoke and lived, entirely different ways. That I think in, in many ways parallels you and I. You and I were in the world when, before we came to Christ. When we were in the world, we listened to the world, we spoke like the world, we watched what the world watched, we found ourselves thinking like the world thought. But then when we came to Christ, suddenly there was a challenge because the Spirit of God was placed in us and the Holy Spirit He's called the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God, in that sense, carried all the culture of heaven. And so the culture of heaven suddenly was, was birthed into our heart. So we found ourselves with ways of thinking, with things that we were doing, that were contrary to the ways of heaven. And so the Spirit of God in us, we found there was a conflict. And, and in a sense it's reversed with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and Daniel in that they had known the ways of God. And then they are thrust into a way where the world seeks to come in on them. So this is what we're going to be talking about this morning. The Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God doesn't talk like the world. The Spirit of God doesn't act like the world. So when we talk like the world and when we act like the world, there comes an inward, inward conflict. 
An inward conflict between the way that we think and the way we talk and the way the Spirit of God wants us to think and the way the Spirit of God wants us to, to talk and wants us to live. Let me read the first part of verse 8. It said, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and, and wine. And he asked, all right, we'll just do this uh, first part. So Daniel recognized that to live by the world's way would defile him. And, and this is the a wording that, that's used here, would actually be defiled. So he, he knew that it would cross over completely against the way that he'd been raised. Now knowing he had been raised as a Levite, he'd been raised as one who would become a priest. And so there were even more restrictive uh, practices and ways on him than on other Jews who were taken into, into Babylon. So there is a challenge here where the, the food and the drink and, and, and all the ways of Babylon are being, are being spread out before these, these, these godly men. But here is the conflict. And the uh, conflict is between flesh and spirit. The conflict is between the ways they know that are the ways of the Spirit of God, the ways of the flesh that have been thrust on them. You and I have exactly the same conflicts. Let me just um, read to you a well-known scripture from 1 John chapter 2. It said, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, Pride of life comes from the Father. Comes not from the Father, let me get that one right, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. And whoever does the will of God lives forever. Amen. BND, scripture, and this has been used more recently in preaching by myself and others, but from James 4 and verse 4, it said, uh, James writes, he said, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity or being an enemy of God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, they're heavy words, aren't they? They're very heavy words, especially when, when we've lived a certain way and then we've come to Christ and then the Spirit of God in us is challenging us to, to talk differently. The Spirit of God is challenging us to think differently. The Spirit of God is challenging us to act differently. And, and so we have a choice. If we will follow the Spirit of God, or we will just go back and allow the world to do its thing in us. So, if you live by the world's way, you speak the way the world speaks, follow the world's way of living, you will grieve the Holy Spirit. You will grieve the Holy Spirit. If you live by the world's way, you speak the way the world speaks, follow the world's way of living, you will lose your love for Christ and you'll lose Christ's pleasure. Now I chose that word very, very carefully. How many know that nothing will take away from the love of Christ for you? Amen. We can do the most hideous, the most incredibly awful things. The love of Christ for us will not change one iota. The love of the Heavenly Father for us will not change one iota. But I'm thinking the number of times that the Lord Jesus said, I do those things that please Him. And I think when Paul wrote it, and uh, he said, my aim is to please Him. See, the Lord Jesus wanted to know the pleasure of His Heavenly Father. Paul wanted to know the pleasure of His Heavenly Father. The pleasure of Christ. And see, I want, I want you to live a life where you know the pleasure of Christ. And, I'm, and as I said, you, know, you can do the most terrible things. God will love you. Others won't. But God will love you. Christ will love you. But you can lose the pleasure of your God. You can lose... The pleasure of Christ. I think as we grow with Him, that becomes more and more important. I know for me, where I'm, I'm, I'm at now, there are many things I would lose before I would want to lose the pleasure of Christ. There are many things that I would be willing to, to lose before I would lose that sense that, that He looks down and He is pleased with me. So when I say the pleasure of Christ, I'm saying that, that He is pleased with you. And I know we can have awful things happen to us when we're kids and have things said about us that squash us and make us feel so terrible. And, and we feel that we can never know the pleasure of God. But I want you to know you can know the pleasure of God. You can know the pleasure of Christ. I want you to know if you live by the Spirit, you will. Know the pleasure of Christ. As I said, the love of God does not diminish. It doesn't change. 
Nothing you can do will make him love you more and nothing you can do will cause him to love you less. Nothing but the pleasure of Christ, the pleasure of the Heavenly Father is a different thing. The second part of verse 8. It said that, I'll just read the, the first part. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the raw food and wine. But then this second part. He asked the chief official for permission not to devour himself in this way. Now sometimes I have met Christians, and I hope you're not, you're not one of them. If so, I'm about to tread on your toes. And I've, I've met Christians, they have a zeal for God. But you know, in that zeal, there's a great deal of judgment. In that zeal for God, they, 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 and, and if they feel that something should be done a certain way, there can never be a compromise. I have learned more recently there's a very big difference between conviction and preference. Conviction is something you do not compromise no matter what. Preference is something you do. And I've often come across Christians who, in their zeal for God, they make the two one. And so there can be something that I think is small, and I think, look, um, uh, if, if that doesn't go the way I want it to go, it's a preference, I go a certain way, not a conviction. If it doesn't happen the way I want to go, I can step back and everything's hunky-dory. Do we still use that, that term? Yeah. Hunky-dory. But everything's all right. But if there's a conviction in my heart, and that gets trampled on in some way, that's an entirely different thing. And sometimes when a Christian, they become so zealous for God that they make one the same as the other. Now Daniel, even though he knew he did not want to defile himself, the scripture said he asked permission. What a submissive heart. What a submissive heart. Remember many, many years back when I had uh, uh, gone to uh, Bible College and I was in a college that was very strict in terms of um, relationships. It was a missionary training college. And uh, because of that, they had a very long code of conduct, pages and pages and pages. You signed that and you had to let them know about relationships and, and um, you had to let them know all kinds of stuff. Stuff that I don't think they'd be allowed to ask now, but back then it was very, very strong. If you, if you were found to have developed a relationship with another student in college without the uh, staff's permission, you were expelled from the Bible college. That, that was strong. That was very, very strong. And so during one of the um, um, holiday times, and I was in Newcastle, and then um, someone who I'd known for some years, who became my first wife, Sue, let me just say, Sue is in heaven now, in case I think, who's oh, Jeff divorced? Did Teresa fit into this? But, <laughs> we'll say that, because I, I know, there's a rabbit's roar, I'm going, going down now, if I go too far down there. But let me just say that first of all. All right, so I come back to Bible College and, and God has done a work in my heart and told me that the, the girl, Sue, that I've known for just a few years, she's the girl I'm going to marry. So I go back to college and I go to the principal, uh, Stuart Dinner, and I say, Mr. Dinner, I'd like to get engaged. And he looks at me through those Scottish eyes. <laughs> and he closed whatever he's doing and he said, I went to his accent. It, it sounds like I'm mocking it. Oh, but I really want it. But he said, you go back and you read the college code through and then you come back here immediately after that. that. Wasn't the answer I was looking for. So I went and read the college code. Oh my goodness, pages, pages, pages. I, I, I came back. So he's looking at me and he's saying, well, and I said, well, I recognise the college code, I recognise this is unusual, and, and we, we had to leave it at that. So then I, I, I and he said, look, uh, I'm going to talk it out with the other staff, and then we will get, get back to you. So then I, I, I kind of went back, I felt I was under this cloud, I'm asking God, I'm saying, God, this is of you, I know it's of you, I want you to confirm it, I want you to give me a scripture. And then God instantly, not instantly, God very quickly gave me a scripture. Hebrews 13, 17. I didn't know what it was, but I just had Hebrews 13, 17 in my mind. I thought, great. So I flipped my Bible open. And I'm reading it. And I thought, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. Let them do it with joy and not with grief. I said, God, wrong scripture. <laughs> That wasn't the scripture I wanted. I wanted the one that said, you're right and they're wrong. So you go and do. You've heard from me. That's all there is to it. 
So I go back to the staff meeting, oh my goodness, you've got all the staff sitting around you. And, and all their body language, every arm is folded. Even the legs are folded. If you know anything about body language, if you're trying to sell something to someone and they're looking at you like this, you need to do something. <laughs> because they're not open to you. And so I, I, I said, God's given me a scripture. Oh, you should have seen the arms firm, the legs firm. And they said, what's the scripture? So I said, Hebrews 13, 17. So he looks it up, reads it out. He said, what does it mean to you? And I said, it means to me that whatever you say, I will do. Oh, the arms get unfolded, the legs uncrossed. Everyone sits back. If they had a little hanky, like they'd mop their brow. <laughs> It was still some time before they said, we feel this is a God. But the, can I just put to you, it was a submissive approach to what I felt God had said. And that's what Daniel did here. He, he didn't want to defile himself. But that last part of verse 8, uh, where it's, it says that, um, wherever it is, he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. So his heart was soft. His, his heart was soft. Let's um, read from uh, verse uh, 11. It said, uh, Daniel then said, uh, oh sorry, um, I should have read more. Um, I'll just read verse 9 and 10. Now God had caused the official to show favour and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord the King, who's assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my hair because of you. So he is really concerned that, that, that if Daniel and, and the other three men don't eat this special food, that, that is the, the best possible food for them, that the Babylonians can possibly provide, that they will be, they'll look haggard and they'll look anything but like the, the kind of people that the, the uh, king of Babylon is looking for. So then verse 11, Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. You know, chronology in scripture 10 is an often uh, a number of testing, so it was 40. Then he said, give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. I'm glad that's not me. <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, give us nothing... <laughs> but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for seven days. So let me ask you, what are you feeding your spirit? What are you feeding the inward person? Um, you might be feeding the outward person, all kinds of things, but what are you feeding your spirit? What is your heart getting? What is, what is coming from the outside to the inside? Let me just read to you a scripture from um, 1 Peter. It said, For you have been born again, Peter writes, not a perishable seed, but an imperishable, to the living and enduring word of God. That crackle, is it coming from me or from somewhere else? Yeah. And then Peter goes on, For all people are like grass. All their glory like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fail. The word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. And then Peter goes on. It's in 1 Peter chapter 1, at the very end through the first part of chapter 2. Therefore, he says, rid yourself of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Like, and then he, he said this. He said, like newborn babes, Pray spiritual milk, so by it you may grow up in your salvation, if you have tasted that the Lord is good. So he's saying uh, to them, crave spiritual milk. And, and in the passage before this, he just talked about them, that they were born again, not a perishable seed, but through the living and enduring word of God. Will I use the uh, hand, hand mic? Ah, oh, I just changed it. Yes. 
So, Peter had just said, you've been born again of the Word of God. And then he's saying to them, now, now it's newborn, but crave that word, crave the word, crave the word. And, and like even as a baby would just crave milk, so, so crave the word of God. On the back of our notice sheets, we have, we have readings that follow right through the year. We have short readings, medium readings, and long readings. Our short readings, if you follow those, you'll read through the New Testament entirely in a year, from January 1st through to December 31st or 30th, whatever it is. And then if you follow the medium readings, you'll read through half the Old Testament in a year, and then the second half the next year, and you'll read still through the entire New Testament in a year. And if you follow the long readings, you'll read through the Old and New Testament in a year. Now we're coming to the end of a year. What a great time. If you're not someone who is reading the scripture, you're not someone who's made that, that part of your daily practice, what a great time to, to, to begin that practice and you. So that that living and, and that abiding word of God that, that you, were, you were saved through when you received the word of God's truth into your spirit and were born again of the spirit. And, and so Peter is saying, crave that milk. Crave that milk. Crave the word of God. See, people often cry out and say, God, God, speak to me in some way. I want you to speak to me. And what does God say? I have, I have given you the book. I've given you the book. And, and the book doesn't need to be dry. It doesn't need to be dusty. It doesn't need to be something that you just can't eat. It isn't beetroot. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go on. <laughs> the issue is not just reading the scripture. The issue is having the word and applying the word in our lives. That's the issue. But you can't apply it if you haven't read it. And if you haven't read it, it's like you're just stymied before you even start. So we, we need to have that, that, that practice where we're reading the scripture on a daily basis. Then being able and have, have some other way that we can apply it. I, I, I personally, every day, I, 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 have a, I type up what I, just something that I've seen in that scripture that I have read through. I personally follow through the long readings. I read through the Bible uh, in a year, Old Testament, New Testament. That's what works for, for me. That might not work for you. That might be too much for you. But we need to be more systematic. It's a whole lot better than just getting the Bible, clicking like, what did I read today? You know, you need to have a systematic plan. And we do have booklets over there that follow it right through too, so that it's not just on our uh, notice sheet. Let me read to you verses 15 and 16. It said, At the end of ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than all the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food, the wine they were to drink, and gave them vegetables instead. Now I do want to say this has nothing to do with eating vegetables or not eating vegetables. All right. I'm, I'm talking about the, 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 this was what the world was offering these men. And God was saying, I don't want you to go the world's way. I don't want you to feed on what the world is feeding on. I want you to feed on what I'm giving you. So, when I read further, when I read earlier from 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, 17, 15, 16 and 17, and it talked there about the lust of the eyes, the lust, sorry, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I just want to take these one by one. I want you to imagine two different people. On this side, sorry folks, this is the one who's fed on the world. This is the one who's fed through the spiritual disciplines. Now this one, so when we come to the first one, the lust of the flesh, and I, I'm going to use three other words that begin with P because it just helps me remember the first one, passions. So imagine this person, they feed themselves on what the world says and they don't put a limit on it. So when the world uh, talks about uh, free sexuality in every way, they give themselves over to that. When the world talks about uh, every kind of violence, they give themselves over to that. 
every kind of eating and drinking passion, drugs passion, a gambling passion that goes on and on and on and on. They give themselves over there. This is the person over here. What about the next one? Lust of the first one, the lust of the flesh, second one, the lust of the eyes, possessions. We live in a, a obviously a, a Western world is incredibly materialistic. You know, one thing that I love about when people do um, short term short term mission trips like this one to um, Thailand, you are never ever the same person after that. You you come back with a with a, a different sense of how you're going to use money. And even if after a time it kind of dribbles down and dilutes, but I tell you there's something that you never ever lose. When you see people who just pour out all their money on these ridiculous things, well, I think they are, rid ridiculous things that are just possession things, possession things, and sometimes I think, well, they've got nothing else. But, but when I look at this, I'm thinking, God, if you could get hold of what, what people around in third world nations are going through, and then we could somehow take Australians and put them into third world nation for just a week or a fortnight, then bring them back here, we would be a different people. We would be a different people. We would live more simply just so the rest of the world can simply live. I didn't say that first of all. It's been said by many, many different people. Sometimes when I've been to parties with young children, sometimes there may be 20, 25 kids at these parties. How many know when you're a kid to have 25 people all bringing gifts would have been extraordinary? Um. But you know, I'm looking at the gifts. I'd say the minimum gift is probably $30. You multiply that by 25 and you get what? 750 right? Okay. About that. <laughs> You're all a maths teacher. 750 bucks worth of, worth of toys for these, for these kids. And I'm just sitting there and in my, inside I'm just thinking, God, what's, what's, what's happening? We're, we're like, you know, we don't, we don't give kids so much other stuff, so we give them possessions instead. Then when they grow up materialistic and, and not having a heart for people, we say, oh, where did I go wrong? Well, the next one. The last one, the pride of life, prominence. I remember many, many, many years back when someone talked about narcissism. I can't even say it properly. I remember thinking, I must look that word up one day. And then I looked it up and then I began to hear it more and more and more and more. I'm driving home from the um, Connect Group over at the Wendy's the other night. I had ABC Radio on and they're talking about the difference between uh, someone who is suffering, or not suffering, I think suffering, but someone who is a narcissist, someone who's a Machiavellian narcissist, and someone who's a psychopathic. Oh my goodness, was that... I, I, I nearly went the long way home just to hear it out to the end. Because it was just so fascinating. The difference between them. And they're just saying the world is increasingly filled with people who are increasingly filled with themselves. Yes. And that's all they really care about. Prominence. So we've got passions. We've got possession. We've got prominence. Lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh. Pride of life. Now, over here. Oh, you wonderful people. You're the ones who have allowed God and the, the spiritual disciplines of, of, of reading the scripture, applying the scripture, praying, worshipping, thankful. Oh, you're a spiritual bunch over here. Amen. You need to have a chat to something. Speak it out, brother. Then, then after a period of time, if I compare someone who's been raised up this way, sorry guys, and someone who's been raised up this way, I tell you, which one do you want to spend your time with? No one answered. <laughs> I remember years back hearing part of a debate between a, a well-known atheist, and I don't remember if it was Hitchens or uh, one of those men, and, um, and a, uh, a, a well-known Christian apologist. And, and part of it, where the atheist was saying, you know, Christians are exactly the same as everybody else. There's nothing that they have. There's no difference in their life. And then, as a, as a parting comment, the Christian had said, and this was a debate in America, in an American university. He said to him, he said, just imagine, you are walking down, and he named a city in America that's notorious for violence, and he named part of that city that's just notorious for muggings, robberies, murders, rapes, all kinds of stuff going on. It's an area where the police don't want to go down there because it is so dark and so evil. 
And so he just said to the atheist, he said, if you found yourself, you had to walk through this neighborhood, and it's the middle of night, and you're walking down there, and then you hear behind you a whole group of men. And you can just hear them talking. And you, you begin to just wonder what's going to happen. And then you can hear that they're walking faster than you, and that they're getting closer to you. What's going through your heart? And then the Christian said, would it make a difference if you heard this was a men's Bible study group? And of course the atheist who is thinking, oh, what would I, well, I would be in that Bible study group. And he had to admit, that would make a difference. Why would it make a difference? Because even though he had debated and said, the Bible doesn't change anyone, he knew that if people have allowed the scripture into their heart, it does change them. And it makes them better people. And I tell you, that is the absolute truth. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these three men following Daniel in refusing to go the world's way. Verse 17, that we bring this to a, to a close. He said, to these four young men, God gave knowledge, understanding of all kinds, literature, learning. Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. The end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, now listen to this. He found them ten times better Amen. than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Ten times better. Amen. If someone says, does it make a difference if I feed myself on what the world feeds? Does it make a difference if I then turn away and I, let, I, let, I, I employ the spiritual disciplines and I let the word of God get into my heart? I tell you what, it not only makes a difference, it makes ten times the difference. Amen. 